Aviation that the East Africa School of Aviation, where the Tallinn Centre was supposed or is located by the Commission, that's the IBC, and the family cannot reach him or even trace him. That's the announcement just in right now from the IEBC temporary headquarters. That's the bombers of Kenya. Right away from that, this is a story we are following up for you. It's not the end you. It's not the end of it. You're not hearing the last of it. We'll definitely be following up for you. But let me take you now to my colleague, Eric Lativ, who's still seated on the other side. Yes, indeed. Ken Mijungu, thank you very much for that. We continue the coverage and analysis of what's happening around the country. And that news coming from bombers of Kenya is big. I'm still here with my colleagues from the Situation Room on Spice FM, Nduoko and C.T. Muga. That is uh, some shocking news. I mean, the, the way the IBC chairman has just delivered it, you know, I wish to announce to the country that uh, the Embakasi East returning officer uh, has gone missing. He's been missing since he said it so calmly, and yet it means so much. There are easily about five things that you can tick off in terms of importance of what he's just said. Mbakasi East, a key area in the Nairobi, um, in, Nair in Nairobi County, number one. Number two, one that has had uh, eyeballs of everybody over the last two uh, over the last two days. And then we're looking at a similar situation of what had occurred during the last election, whereby a key figure in the commission, for the commission, disappeared. disappears. This is not your chicken change kind of thing. This is a big deal. The manner in which it has been delivered, unfortunately, uh, then would appear as though it doesn't really matter but it matters. And if anything, we were already seeing levels of anticipation and anxiety from around the country reaching staggering levels. If anything, something like this takes it to DEFCON. <laughs> because that's you know, what we are looking at now. You know, I laugh, but it isn't a laughing matter. Because mm. one, it's like any opportunity that could pile up the anxiety that is already palpable. Anything of this sort, if we're going by history, as you mentioned it, now simply heightens it. There was an article that was written in the nation today by Mutumai Matthew. And among the things he said, very well thought out, very well written, talking about the role of the media, how we missed an opportunity to work together in the same way we did during the presidential debate, talking about the various interests that media houses have, which sometimes prevent them. And he alluded strongly to, well, media houses also having certain positions as to whom they actually prefer as a candidate. Mm. But our situation isn't as strong as some of the Western countries. But the thing that he mentioned that now would help heighten uh, any anxiety is that two media houses have reported that the systems were attacked. One said the system was attacked, the other one that the data was contaminated. Now, the moment you hear that, you start wondering, so what exactly is happening with this elections now it could be at the level where you're saying it is an allegation but is it not the same thing we've seen social media playing out with early days everyone declaring that they have won whatever right. it is they have won they alone knew and the odd thing is that at such times people tend to believe what they read they, they, this pausing and saying let's check let's verify fact checking it is said mm. anxieties rise some other news comes, anxiety rises. Another one, and now it's playing out in people saying we want the results out. And yet, historically, when have we ever had the results being announced day two, day three after the elections? Have we ever? But the memory is brief. Maybe it's just the anticipation and hoping mm -hmm. that this time it will be different. You're right. And also the management of the communication, which I must say the IBC has really tried, you know, to every time emphasizing we have a seven day window and we are gonna try as much as possible not to go to the seven <coughs> days but do it much faster. But this is what we must do. We must receive the physical forms thirty four A and forms thirty four B from the constituencies coming to Bomas so that then we can verify and then we shall pre create form 34c and there we shall then declare a winner you know it's taking us through that whole process very mm. slowly so when you hear that we are expecting 290 returning officers from the constituency to come but one of them is missing oh it means uh, we have 289 
yeah. returning officers that we know where they are there's one that's missing so what does it mean okay came to work excused himself to go to the washroom was not seen again it just creates that anxiety and of course i understand uh, what fula chimkati is not in charge of security he just says we've reported this to the security agencies and we hope the security agencies can do the best that they can to locate this person kenya security agencies locate people from uh, holes when yes. they need to mm. somebody is suspected to have killed somebody in uh, where was the athlete killed and then the next yeah. the person is being arrested somewhere heading down towards yeah. Mombasa. Mombasa yeah. you are located within a very short time yes i'm sure by the time of fuller chebukati is announcing this of course this had already been escalated sure. to the highest levels of security and the efforts to trace this returning officer were already on high gear but then what does it mean in terms of now the tension that we sure. you know that whole feeling of okay so uh the unease that mm. you're talking about mm. look at the pattern of incidences that have been going on i mean what did we see in the morning today with the whole you know kerfuffle at uh, starehe constituency uh tallying center and then we're going into the day and then we see what's been happening at bomas and i mean just look at the things that have been going on and then we hear this at night on this day exactly what it does is that it continues to escalate the anxiety that we're already seeing amongst people two incidences today in a taxi and then in a supermarket and the question that is coming from people is when are they going to announce the results so that we can get back to life and this is the thing if anything it just has people walking around with their hearts in their mouths and it is not a good position to be in um there's the understanding that seven days after you know uh is when announcements will be made it flies out the window for a lot of people that it is not in your mind it is not on your radar that we still have three days to go within which the IEBC can you know make this announcement and make this declaration but unfortunately these incidents or these things that are happening before then actually make the decision the the tense situation a lot more tense you know so it, it it doesn't it's not a comfortable place to be in for a lot of people and a lot of people going to bed tonight probably thinking okay so now what exactly does this mean and for with the absence of information i mean nature abhors a vacuum if there's no information in terms of what's happening where did this gentleman go yes probably your security a agencies already knew uh yesterday that this man had gone missing an important cog in this wheel that without him mm. this announcement will delay even further but how do how do you as a commission how do we all because we also stakeholders in this then manage this rising anxiety because we are coming just the last two days or three days there's been yes rising anxiety but also a feeling of oh this time the ibc has done really well the ibc has been open the ibc has made the results available to everybody in the world and you know where you can go and get it it's just that now we're all feeling i mean this is too much work i'm not going to start counting for the 6229 oh. forms and start telling for myself i'll wait for the ibc to do the job and as i wait for the ibc to do the job i, I hope they can do it faster because you know i paid them okay mm. <laughs> and then you start seeing the political class do what we saw in starehe yeah going in there you know gang hall with allegations oh you know we've caught, caught you we've caught a returning officer with the uh, voting material with electro material we've taken them to a police station what we've seen in bombers this evening allegations and counter accusations of yo, oh, you know how, why are these people allowed in there and why are we not allowed in there and why do they have computers, do they have computers? we don't have computers, don't have computers. Mm -hmm. i mean it was okay when all these guys were back at home waiting to be told whether yes. they won or lost now they have got their results now they've got their results they're idle <laughs> they're coming back now to start rile up emotions it. amongst kenyans yeah. essentially that's what is happening right now because the, the situation that we're looking at unfortunately once you get that rising tension who's to tell what will happen with it when people are, are no longer holding it within who's to tell what will happen actually the question that i would ask is the same tone timber manner in which politicians were seeking votes shouldn't a similar amount of energy be spent in calming the nerves of your supporters mm. and 
well, I'm talking about all compet all politicians, all co apart from saying thank you very much for voting me or thank you for not voting me in, should they also not be saying, folks, why don't we do A, B, C? Mm. Because if they speak, and the, because they are silent, mm. if they speak and tell people, be calm, let's wait for these results. Do we hear it? No. Do we, do we hear them rallying people to be calm? Do we hear them rallying people to wait for the IBC to make the announcement? We are no. seeing all of them, all these political actors on social media saying, oh, tomorrow, mm. it is us. Tomorrow, it's us. All of them claiming that they know they have won. Have won. They know they have won, all right? And they are not saying, you know, so, okay, we have our numbers, we are prepared for whatever outcome, we know that. Nobody is saying we know our, our, our numbers, but everybody, let's just no. come and wait for the IEBC. Not a single let's support people. this process. It would appear as though there's a certain element of benefit that the one would derive if you're in a tense situation or if things have gone to the dogs. Because if you realize the danger that lies therein, then you would do the exact same thing that you're saying. Mm -hmm. Tell your supporters, tell your people to calm down and kind of wait it out and see. But it would seem as though you prefer a situation where things have gone out of whack. So my mind has gone down memory lane and I cannot recall them. It may have happened and I missed it, mm -hmm. but I cannot recall situations where the political class have actually gone out of their way to calm nerves. It seems like a political class do to either of two things. Either keep quiet, absolute silence, nail by mouth as we say, mm. or be inflammatory, or say things that will support your cause, which in many cases are the same thing as mm. being inflammatory. So, and it looks like today is Friday, isn't mm. it? Mm. We're going to get on Saturday, Sunday, then Monday. Monday, then Tuesday is the last day. Yes. yes. Tuesday is the day within which, by then, the IEBC should have made an announcement so of, we're on talking the winner Monday. of the presidential election. And this is the thing, that with all the things that are happening in between, one cannot help but to speculate in terms of, so what does that really mean? What does it mean? And how does it then affect the dates for, or the date within which this announcement ought to be made? You know, everything we're saying here, falls in the category of what you could refer to as allegations. Mm. But to what end? Because there are those who claim we have evidence. Mm. We know this has happened and we have evidence. Yes. So are we seeing a situation again where people are marshalling themselves to have an electoral decision made by the courts? Mm. Which is still within their rights. But just you, you don't have to create doubt in the whole process if you have an issue just say all right i've got uh, one or two misgivings and i'm prepared to go to court i'm gonna go to court next week or i'm gonna go to court now that the election has been declared especially for all those other those other seats just saying i will be heading to court mm -hmm. i congratulate the winner but i do not agree with the process i have some challenges here and there i'm going to court mm -hmm. or i do not accept uh, the outcome i'm going to court but don't come on onto social media and say it is so decided. There is no rerun. So and so has won. We have we have a voter suit. I'm ready for. And what we are seeing you doing in Bomas is something different. All right, totally different. Anyway, so we wait to see what um, the security agencies will do, and of course, an update from Wafula Chebukati on the issue of this missing returning officer. It's our hope, really, that he is well. He's safe. Right. Well, it's our hope and prayer that the disappearance is something that once he appears, hopefully, he can explain will, will be easily to explain and say, ah, is that the reason why? Mm. Is this what has happened? And just say, okay, we move on. Let's look at something else that's happened uh, in the poll, right? In, and this is with regards to the big names that have fallen and the big names that are, have uh, come back. And also, the big thing that has, has happened this time we are going to have six women governors mm. out of 47 yep. governors in total this is double what we had last time last time well if there's been a cry it's been heard if there has been an opportunity for women to come and actually show uh, what their experience then has led them to be able to do i think that it has then been answered by uh, the people who voted them in to double the number uh, just five years later and say all right let's add a few more we're well, looking at homa bay we're looking at Kwale county and uh, the new one then would be machakos county um adding on to your kirinyaga and uh, we also no, we have, have nakuru well. which is a new one as well and now meru 
which is what we're looking at now, which all of them, Kuala County, first time you have a woman um, in that position. We're also looking at the coast area where the first time we have a woman MP uh, in Kuala County as well, first time in Gidunguri. I mean, these are some of the things that we're looking at. We're saying that, all right, again, going back to the conversation that we had earlier about the fact that the, the, um, the woman rep position in terms of affirmative action has really elevated women to the point whereby they have been given the opportunity to prove what they can do uh, in leadership for the nation. Now, to see this number double in this election already means that there's an element of trust that then has been applied and that they've seen that you can do something with the position that you've had previously and how about they give you more in terms of responsibility and if anything i would say this is a good thing it's a good showing absolutely i think it is if you just look at the the six women so let's start with gladys wanga mm. new governor of homer bay yes she was a woman rep uh we look at uh, the new governor kawira mwangaza of mm. meru mm. woman rep okay um, if, if we go to Kwale, this is the deputy governor who now takes over as governor. Yeah. If we go to Machakos, this is a chief administrative secretary mm -hmm. who has tried for this position twice and she gets it the third time. Susan Keheka, from Speaker Same. of the County Assembly Same. to the Senate, rising to this point. Mm -hmm. You can clearly see, I mean, the exposure in the other seats also builds confidence in people and people can see you're right yeah i mean this person i have absolutely no doubt when people are electing susan keheka the first time into the senate they didn't have any issue with electing susan keheka they've also elected now uh, keroche mm -hmm. to senate mm -hmm. the people of nakuru have no issue so we are moving as much as yes we have all these issues about our democracy and how we are managing our political uh, discipline and bad manners but I, th I think there's, there are very many positives to take out of this. Mm. Absolutely. When we look at uh, the struggle and how it has been, really, when we're looking at... I mean, there still is a very evident struggle when it comes to gender balance. And even looking at the two-thirds gender rule, that's going to take some time. Ha Parliament hanging in the balance when it comes to the dissolution of Parliament because of the inability to achieve that two-thirds gender rule. But I think you're hearing an unheard voice... Uh, that has not been heard historically mm. that we actually want to give women the opportunity we want to give them a chance to be able to govern um, at whatever level to then head and lead a county and then be able to now push forward the factors of devolution now you're looking at a situation whereby you can actually say women can be trusted with leadership where previously the conversation was never being had at all <laughs> uh, you know and so now you're saying here's an opportunity that we can do and you know the thing is it's not concentrated it's spread around the country. Yep. We're looking east, west, you know, and it's happening whereby the option is being set and the decision is being delivered and then women are coming into this position. And I think that you're looking at a, you're looking at a place whereby it'll, it is going to continue to spread. And the struggle will not be as tense to achieve this two-thirds gender rule. And maybe this is another way in the door. It could be. There are many ways to skin a cat, they say. Are you going to depend on the National Assembly to say, let's achieve this, or can you use another way to get into the door? And maybe this is just one of the ways that that will happen. You know, it's, all, it's, it's interesting how we segment information and views. Yeah? We talk about women in leadership as though it's something new, and yet the households that we come from exhibit women leadership mm -hmm. throughout our lives. Yep. In our African setting, the people who bring up children are the mothers. Mm. Now, do you require any evidence that that is the best form of leadership you can talk or think of you'd be surprised to see quite a number of people do require more evidence to show that in as much as a woman can lead in the home then you need a lot more to prove Actually, that she can lead an area geographical area for government uh, I, you would be you would be uh, hard pressed to find somebody who... the very militant tone that has entered the conversation yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I don't think it's it's so much uh, evidence but people coming to terms with certain realities mm. because Representation, as we now consider in the political sphere, it isn't as though women started representing uh, the public through a plebiscite yesterday in this country. It's mm. been there for the longest time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the resistance has very little to do with the ability of women to lead. It has more to do with the boys' club ensuring 
yes, that they that can it, be accepting of this. Yes, and yeah. that they keep it a boys' club as much as they possibly can. All right? Whatever the reasons, it is clear. Because you cannot say that you have a complete disregard for something in your constitution and you have the ability to do something with it and then you do not. Mm. And for the period of five years, you do not. So that's what I'm saying. It's the boys club ganging up and deciding this is not what they don't. Yet they know that they are in complete abrogation of what the constitution states. Sure. Yes. I think having the conversation, when we look at relinquishing power, is probably the bigger issue here. Mm. Not necessarily that those who make a decision or those who seek for gender parity uh, don't feel that it's a good thing. But the position where you are in, waking up to the reality that somebody else that you for, for the longest time considered to be the weaker sex then would be taking over from a position that you've held on to for the longest time. For the, and you also thought that there was the thinking that women could not lead or could not govern. I don't think that's what it is. But you would be in a position where you would have to relinquish this power to somebody else and you'd be left out in the governance cold. And I think that's the fear of what could be lost as opposed to what could be gained if you had, you know, a woman in this position. It's a manifestation of what you see playing out in the political sphere. Whether it is someone tagging someone in the most negative way possible, mm. whether it is someone creating an image that this is the most incompetent person ever born, or whether it is a situation where somebody is actually deliberately bastardizing a situation that involves someone else so that the absence of fair play that we often witness in politics just happens to manifest itself that way and it becomes clearer when it's dealing with women mm -hmm. but ask yourself at any local level when people are politicking the smear campaigns that people get, get involved in mm -hmm. at the next at every level then you get to the national level people call it tribal Yes. It works for you when someone else can easily be blamed for problems that you yourself has created. So, again, it's a manifestation of a certain process, a certain mindset. It just manifests itself now, perhaps a little louder, when yeah. it comes to, uh, mm -hmm. to women. Mm. Have you, do you hear of politicians genuinely owning up to problems? It's always someone else who is responsible for the problem, always. And they don't seem to understand that in following this path, you are laying... <laughs> Uh, some very very fertile ground for others to follow in your footsteps whichever way you lean yes so you, you end up with a country where nobody takes responsibility it's only someone who's to blame yeah it's somebody else yes shift it here the other person shift it next door as eric used to put it kick the can down the road mm. Mm. another issue is uh, the shape of our county governments so out of the 47 governors we are likely to have more than 38 being new governors mm. completely new governors brand new in, brand new from the mint so this is for example um apart from nandi kajiado nyamira kirinyaga tarakanithi kisumu where else are we having a governor uh, coming back to office and then other counties which have first term governor who lost in the second time and now is mm. coming back kitui with malombe uh, like Kipia. Uh, Bungoma, you know, so the others are going to be completely new people who come into office. Some are replacing, of course, exiting governors who served two terms, and others are kicking out existing governors who have not served two terms. Yeah. But the point is, the face of devolution is also going to have a completely new council of governors. Mm. Now, uh, how uh, like we're having a conversation in the morning with Wahoro and he says, you know what, whenever we change, the new government comes in with new energy. Yes. And they are coming in at least, even if they are taking long or whatever, whatever motivated them to come in, they'll be thinking of, I need to move something. So it, it's going to be pushing the, the state of devolution forward. Mm -hmm. But is it, is this what's going is to happen? Is it sustainable? Eric. 35 new governors, let's say, even say. I, I am of the view that in these matters, if we're to go by past evidence, I expect nothing until I see it. That's really my view. Because 
governors are politicians of a fairly high order and they are following the script that presidential candidates have followed, senators, MB members of parliament. So they will say what they will do. I will believe it when I see it. <laughs> That's the only thing. I'm not going to believe anything else. That there will be change. When I see it, I will say I can see change, but not before then. Okay. Do you think the people are making a choice here um, of a, a governor? Oh, well, there's also Nyeri with Kahiga, who has also come back. Do you think people are making a choice of a new governor or kicking out a, a, a governor who has not served two terms because they feel that this governor has let them down or is it because of a political wave? You know, it could be both. It, it, it need not be one thing. Mm. It could be that the options that were there and whatever it is that the governor has done is deemed as being appropriate or appropriate enough to give him a second chance. It could also be that the narrative that was cast before that if there's a candidate who supports a certain political party in that region, the likelihood of them ascending that position was, should we say, distinctly dimmed. Mm -hmm. And we could argue that that has also come into play. But for me, the thing that is perhaps significant is not even who is elected, but the larger question of why and how we elect. Mm -hmm. That to me is a larger question. Do you think that people who are making the decision for somebody who's coming into that position are thinking about that when you're voting? And I think this is the perennial question that's asked. When you're making that decision at the ballot, are you thinking, is this actually the best person for the job? Or do we still have elements that are overriding what many would deem as common sense um, uh, for those issues? Where this person is from compared to where I am from? Is this person from my backyard? Has this person been able to see me as it were and so then i can make a decision based on that how often and with what you know repetition is it that you make a decision at the ballot because of what you know this individual will do in the position for which they're asking your vote for you know the um there are many signs that one sees that perhaps tell us a much larger story than the things we hear mm. okay if you look at the voter registration, let's move any discussion or element or suggestion of foul play and just say, let's look at how many people who are eligible to be registered got registered. Mm. We fell short of the mark mm. significantly. So one could argue it wasn't for lack of effort. Right. But it does tell you a story that people are not particularly interested in this process. A clear, that is one clear indication. Mm. It isn't the only one. Then we get to the actual point of voting. And then the percentages of those registered against those who actually vote also tell us a completely different story. Now, these are the stories that you look at, and that, these are the stories that answer the question that I was asking. Yeah. And, and it can't be a uniform response. You go to every area and you'll find that the answer is different and it's specific to that particular area. But it's yes. along the same line. Yes. Yeah. Because there are parts of this country that would argue they still don't have roads, okay? Just to put it simply, mm. the perennial problem of roads and water. Mm. Yeah. So roads are an issue if they aren't there. The other places they've had roads for the longest time, then mm. their problem is, not, is hospitals. All I'm saying is the way we vote as Kenyans is something that is worthy of a study. Studies have been done but they were more of surveys than studies, if you ask me. Yeah. Detailed asking and going around the country to determine what it is that makes people vote the way they do. Mm. And since I don't have that particular data, I can comment in the vague manner I've commented <laughs> and leave it there. <laughs> and just assume that, you know, with this, yes. uh, this it will go. Yes. We have very many um, governors who have, well, not very many, we have several governors who have retained their, uh, their seats. Mm -hmm. We have governors who were there before who've come back. Now, what does this say about these counties? For example, like Kipia has gone back to its first governor, yes. has voted out its second governor. Kitui has done the same, um, gone back to Malombe. Bungoma has gone back to Lusaka. Mm -hmm. You were there before, people felt, eh, voted somebody else. You come back and people like, Still, by the way, you know, you, you were not so bad. Eh? It's 
<laughs> what does it say about <laughs> is it about the character of these people or the fickle or minded the, nature of no. people yeah no. or is it the polit the politics of the day mm. yes plays a part but in many instances just how much money someone spent sure because imagine somebody who is grounded fundamentally in what they think or what they believe a leader should come and do where it pinches you usually is where you can where you feel the most pain and you know that certain things need to be done if you believe fundamentally that a leader will be able to deliver on one two three very rarely then would they be able to come and change your mind on that somebody else come change your mind because you know the kind of leader that you're looking for is the one who is going to be resolute in their action on one two three mm. and then somebody comes along and says something different and you go along with that person fickle-minded nature fickle-minded nature and it really does exist ac across the board very rarely will you find few people who will stick to the agenda no matter what it is if you believe in something, the likelihood of you sticking with it mm. is greater than if you don't. And we see that truly, truly, the things that would-be leaders come and tell people that we're going to do for you, people do not believe it. It sounds nice. It sounds, you know, at the time, like something that you want to consume, but people do not believe it. That is why you can kick somebody out of parliament today by voting somebody else in in the next round. Because you didn't really believe what it was that they were offering you in the first place <laughs> so you're getting rid of somebody to bring somebody else in you're saying something by that as well and then after a while you you bring them back no but consider for an instance huh? okay. just consider the one thing that the voter is assured of and a thing of power is a vote yes mm. perhaps this is a study in how the voter handles power forget just the vote because this is the power they have mm. to punish you to reward you to do all sorts of things to you and they know they have it do they know they have the power yes they do. or do they know they have the vote no the people, they know they have the power the people who are coming out to vote today look at the throngs of people who made it out even though we're talking about low turn low voter turnout yeah. do people sit and think as i'm walking into this booth with my six pieces of paper <laughs> what i hold in my hand is power untold uh i wouldn't quite put it that way but they do understand that they have power. Mm. Believe me, they do. Because if you have a situation where somebody can foretell, mm. we had Mwishmiwa Kioni telling us, you are told in advance, you will not make it. What do you think? It's the people who have decided. Yeah. Mm. It's not you. You think you are going to be elected, but they're telling you, you know, we're not voting you in. <laughs> <laughs> so they understand this, it's the power that they have. They know they have the power. So, so we all don't. know this is power. Yes. And then now we, then we balance the power with the, you know, what you are saying, the human nature. We like familiarity. Yes. yes. So when we get to a point when you're feeling, I this person is not serving me. Yes. The first thing that I think of is the other person. Yes. That yes, I who knew was there before. About, yeah, who was there before. So if the person comes back, they are likely to get the vote. Sure. Yes. It's basically just getting there and saying, we'd rather go back to Egypt. Exactly. And it may we not necessarily pumpkins. be. Right. Exactly. We had, you know, milk. <laughs> it, it's not necessarily that you believe that that person can help you, but you're trying to get rid of this person, which is an absolute failure, and you didn't know what to do otherwise. So you're not necessarily bringing in somebody. You're getting rid of somebody. Mm. And that's the thing. And, and that's what I'm saying. Do we fundamentally believe in the objectives of the people who come and say that we should give them a position in power do we fundamentally believe that they can actually do it if we did there's some who do actually and you will find that those people will vote in a particular pattern yeah, every there, time there are some who do but remember every time. if you promise the voter and this is a sign you look at the reaction tells you some believe and i would dare to argue a good number do because if they're displeased with you, mm. what are they displeased about? It's broken promises. Mm. And so, two things. They want an in-your-face situation so that you, they can tell you, Nani, you, you wait and see. <laughs> and is there a better way than bringing the person who uh, you, you beat the last time? Say, mm. okay, <laughs> we're bringing that person just to show you what we think of you. <laughs> Let's conclude the conversation then so we can take it back to Ken Mijungu. So he takes us around the country and then shows us the latest figures that we have. Your closing comments on this? Mm. Uh, I think we'll get to a point where I think also during this election we found people interrogating more before this, during the campaigns, interrogating more, asking more questions. And I think as, you, as democracy starts to mature, 
However that may be defined, you'll find that the interrogation continues and probably you have people making decisions based on what they actually feel is an inherent, you know, move in the right direction. And you are? Uh, we need to calm the nerves of the citizens. Mm -hmm. We need to explain to them that there's life after the election, after the announcement of the win of the presidential race. We need to tell them that the president is the president for those who voted for them and those who didn't. All right. Thank you very much. So let's cross over to the Bombers of Kenya where the IEBC is making an announcement. Here is uh, the IEBC Vice Chairperson, Juliana Chere. And that. Narok County.